So um, I'm going to um, talk to you today and, and give a little bit of context as a presentation of natural history collections with within the museum that I work at. Um, and as Adam said, you know, I'm a, a curator, principal curator at the Natural History Museum. Um, this is a, a picture of me in my lab um, doing science, but um, also as a curator there, I curate and look after um, marine invertebrate collections. So there are things like crabs, shrimps, uh, corals, and I do that kind of research behind the scenes as well. So you can see me sitting there at my microscope as well. So um, part of my role is to um, collaborate with scientists internationally, give them access to those historical natural history collections, um, and also to use historical collections to inform um, uh, to inform and engage with current research, in particular in terms of uh, coral reef and coral reef research and um, climate change. So it's it's a really important collection that I look after. Um, things such as Charles Darwin's um, barnacles and corals that he collected in the um, 1830s and 1840s. Um, but I'm, gonna, as I said, going to give you an insight into my intersectionality in terms of scientific research and um, the creative industries, the artistic um, uh, um, industries and artists that I engage with to basically um, create advocates for the planet, um, to understand things that I do understand but are sometimes very complex to portray um, through some of my scientific work that can be portrayed more easily and become more accessible through um, the intersectionality of science and art and the practice of various artists. So this is a really beautiful slide that I, I love to show and will be on display um, I think next year um, uh, to the public via um, an exhibition that will be held um, at one of the uh, Cambridge University Museums um, uh, here in the UK. And this um, image, um, the painting actually, that was done by um, a French artist called Jean-Baptiste de Brett, um, who was recording um, the environment, um, the collection, the indigenous people and enslaved people in Brazil um, in the early 1830s. And for me, this um, gives a certain level of accessibility, but does actually show who was collecting at that point in time in the 1830s in Brazil, what kind of specimens they were collecting, the equipment that they used, and the plants and animals that were in the environment at that time. Different ways of pre preserving specimens. So you've got someone in a hat with, with a butterfly net and butterflies flying uh, encircling the hat that he's wearing, but also um, a, long, a young um, collector collecting lots of plants there on, on their back. But um, the person holding what I'm assuming is a snake with the butterfly net is also carrying a case which would have been used to press, to press um, flowers. Um, and then you've got on the left there, um, the other collectors collecting um, birds, monkeys, and um, other, other mammals there. Um, for me, this um, image also does help in terms of um, any kind of scientific or uh, biological um, work to understand what plants and animals were in that environment at that point in time and whether that environment still exists and how much it has changed. So it's really important to um, a, another way of valuing not just the things that I look after physically that I showed you that were pickled in jars and we've got things on herbarium sheets, you know, plant spray but also of artistic um, work that was done in those environments in situ at any point in time. So this is a presentation of natural history objects within my collection, which I find very, very interesting because um, these, uh, well, there's, there's a broken bottle on your left, and then there's, um, uh, I haven't discovered or identified what kind of metal this is on the right of a jug, might be pewter, um, I think, but um, these are, um, so this is interesting. 
So you could say at their very first presentation when uh, these objects, I'm calling them objects at this point in time, came to the UK, they came through um, what was known at the time in, 18, in the 18, uh, well, the one on the left um, is from the 1880s and the one on the right is from the 1860s, came to the UK as part of um, well, there were various trade fairs in London, and one of them in 1886 was known as the Colonial Ex Exhibition. So these items or objects would have been displayed in terms of things that were of value. Um, I'm only assuming that the bottle was, was complete at that point in time. But then, interestingly, and I haven't found out yet, but these were bought. I don't know how much they were bought for, and I'll just move ahead and then go back. So I'm currently investigating this. But what is interesting about some of the context of natural history collections is how they were originally collected. So I showed you that painting of a certain environment of, of collection, but also things coming into natural history museums and collections through and seen as um, objects of high value and were bought and were traded. So these are some catalogues and websites, antiques websites, where I'm currently investigating about those two um, items that I, I showed you. So these are part of a collection I look after, so the coral collection. So they are now considered um, natural history objects. So they each, the jug and the bottle have corals encrusting them and um, so there is a loose identification of what the corals are in terms of species or genera and um, where they were collected from so the jug is on the right is from Port Royal um, in Jamaica in the Caribbean and the bottle on the left is from the Bahamas um, so as I say, I'm still investigating this, but it's interesting because um, I'm going to also talking about intersectionality. I will within this whole my presentation kind of move from talking about objects and specimens. So and that's another interesting conversation that I've been trying to have with with many people. Um, so as this is part of my natural sciences collection, they are documented within the museum as specimens. So if you're going to try and search for the objects, the bottle and the jug, you won't find that definition within the museum database. You will find the scientific name of the corals that are encrusting them. And it's also interesting in terms of the natural environment where, so the jug I think was fished, well, it does say on part of the label, it was dived up or fished up from the, from the ocean. Not sure about the bottle, but I'm assuming so as well, because, you know, corals live in the ocean. So that's how they're able to encrust. But how long, and we're talking a lot about the environment now, but how long things last in the ocean and what they can be inhabited by. And also it tells you, um, what corals are in were in that environment at that point in time as well when these objects were collected so all very interesting and current research and there's a lot to be done because I look after thousands if not millions of individual and I'm going to say specimens but there are objects as, as you can see as part of it so when they go on display in an exhibition they become an object but it's interesting to have this kind of discussion. And um, that's what I showed you earlier there of some catalogues that I'm looking at and the, and the different places and spaces where you can find these catalogues, not necessarily within museum archives, but um, the Welcome collection, um, which is linked to, to medicine and Henry Welcome, but also antiques catalogues as well that have documented um, these items in a particular way and a, and a different kind of presentation in that. And also it does help me to get an insight of the, the value at any point in time and um, what is the, the value now and there are different levels of value around any object or natural history specimen, dep depending on how they're displayed and the, the context that they're displayed as well. So this um, is um, an Im uh, 
a photo looking up into the Natural History Museum, into the main hall called the Hintzy Hall. Um, so the space where I work here in central London in the UK. Um, since 2005, it was known as the Gilded Canopy because it's based on a book um, that was uh, written. Uh, so the two authors were two senior researchers um, based at the Natural History Museum. One of them is currently retired. The other one is still um, works at the museum, two botanists. Um, it's an amazing space, but what is interesting about the presentation of natural history here, it does link into, so the museum was opened in 1881. And um, this canopy um, currently has 162 botanical um, illustrations um, that, that each individual panel is uh, surrounded by, by wood and, and then painted on different, different plants. But what it shows here in terms of the architecture, and there's so much that you can see in the preservation, in the presentation of natural history within um, the Natural History Museum, also known as the Cathedral to Nature of Nature, um, is that those plants actually indicate at that point in time, the extent of the British Empire. So it shows um, all the um, produce. So things, uh, plants such as aloe, tea, coffee, which was extensively traded, um, citrus fruits, um, all sorts of uh, uh, um, uh, all sorts of plants there that were very important to the um, to the British Empire, but also to um, trading and the economy worldwide. Um, and I have been investigating. Um, other hidden histories behind some of these um, botanical ceiling panels as well, because what you don't get in terms of the interpretation, so you can get up close and a little bit more personal to these ceiling panels on the second floor balcony, and there is some interpretation there, but the interpretation at the moment is currently in terms of the empire and um, Euro European naturalists such as Hans Sloan, Sir Joseph Banks, um, that were very, um, they, they had wealth and they funded other European naturalists to go and, and collect specimens in the colonies. But what currently it doesn't um, identify are the indigenous people's labor or the enslaved labor that was used or the um, biomedical or indigenous um, medicinal knowledge in terms of the use of this of, of some of these plants. So um, another project that I've been doing for a while is actually unveiling those hidden histories. Um, and those histories um, also, so my um, cultural heritage is from the Caribbean. So my uh, father was from ba Barbados in the Caribbean and my mum from Grenada. So I have also a personal heritage to connection to some of these plants and also the, the history of colonialism, but also it's really important in the presentation of this kind of natural history that a museum in central London has a lot of international visitors. And so it's a different level of engagement and insight as well. There would be international visitors from the Caribbean, for instance, where do they see the story about their heritage? Where, where is it? Where, what, why is it hidden and why is it not there? And also to inform other visitors, you know, as a, as a global community of, um, you know, the baseline of where this material came from, how it, is it, how it was traded and its commercial use today and how it impacts us all and why we should care about the plants and animals in our environment, not just locally to us, but also everything that we do impacts on other parts of the world. So one of the stories is here through um, Carl Linnaeus, and um, he is um, extensively known as a, the Swedish botanist or the, the godfather or grandfather of taxonomy, so that's the naming of plants and animals. And um, he, so uh, the picture in the middle is a close-up picture of one of the um, ceiling panels in the hall, and it's of a plant called Quasia amara. Now, Carl Linnaeus, and this is really interesting because you don't find many people of color who have had historically plants and animals named after them. It's mostly 
um, in the European context and narrative of the naturalists of the time that were doing predominantly doing the, the collecting and were able to document that they were doing that kind of collection. So it's great to see, to be able to reveal um, stories such as this, where Carl Linnaeus actually named that plant after the chap on the left in all the kind of regalia, um, you know, the, the fancy coat and hat. And this is Graman Croze, um, who as a child was enslaved and went from Ghana in Africa um, to Sierra Leone. There he grew up and he learned the um, indigenous practices of various um, plants. So, so he was also known as a healer. Um, they're slightly controversial figure because um, at the time in the uh, mid 1700s, um, Sierra Leone was a Dutch colony and he fought alongside the Dutch against the um, indigenous Maroons, so the freedom fighters within Sierra Leone. Um, but he did um, also heal and attend to the Dutch colonialists and the indigenous Sierra Leone peoples there with um, the bitter tea um, made from the leaves of this plant, which he used to either reduce fever or um, get rid of intestinal um, parasites. Um, so how the plant got named after him is that um, Carl Linnaeus had a student that um, went to Sierra Leone and um, met with um, one of Carl Linnaeus's friends who owned a, a plantation there um, called Carl Gustav. And um, so Graman Quasi sold his kind of like his recipe, his use of this plant um, in terms of medicinal practice and also samples of the plant. And that came back with Carl Linnaeus's student, uh, Roland, um, Daniel Rolander, and came back to Europe where Carl Linnaeus was able to describe um, fully scientifically and publish um, on this plant and name it after Graman Quasi. Oh, and this is just a slide. So um, some of the um, narratives and stories I'm going to tell you about the various exhibitions and the um, context that um, natural history collections are displayed. I, since 2018, have um, developed um, one particular tour um, to acknowledge and also to um, basically give people more access to the, the, the narratives and the knowledge of um, people of colour um, that have been instrumental in, in the science and the world of natural history. So this is someone who came on my very first tour in 2018 who tweeted about it. So this is a, another way of engaging the public to kind of understand what I do and the other stories and to ask questions and to try and understand understand um, the environment and the world around them. So on the other hand, we have um, in the Victorian era, um, so this is quite a little bit of a, um, a fun slide um, from a magazine called Punch um, from the 18, 1853. And this is showing um, uh, one of many favorite pastimes by the Victorians um, in the UK that used to love to go down by the coast and either what they would call take waters. So it was seen as quite a medicinal thing to go to the, to the sea, to the seaside, that kind of thing, and um, do a bit of rock pooling. And so a lot of the um, animals that I study, marine invertebrates, can be found in rock pools in the UK and things obviously deeper in the ocean. But um, this is just quite interesting, um, this pastime, pastime, because within that you can see there's a gentle there that I think is holding, well, holding a net and maybe some seaweed. Um, and I can only imagine the ladies are also finding things like sea anemones and other, other things there, barnacles and, and mollusks. Um, and so this is another form of collection. Now, um, only at this point in time, only those that were quite privileged were able to go to the seaside. Um, so um, in terms of collection there, those that weren't able to go to the coast, they would um, see the anything that was collected from the British coast in museums such as the Natural History Museum that um, at one point was only accessible to certain class of people, but eventually to more to, to everybody, to the working class. And perhaps that was the only time that anybody would able to be to 
um, to see what was in, in the sea, in the deep dark, dark ocean that might have been quite mysterious to them. But visiting a museum, you would be able to see things like these sea anemones that I've got here, this picture here you would see them within a museum context in a, in, in a collection. So these are some jellyfish, part of another collection that I look after and also have some scientific insight into. And um, this collection, um, you can see someone in the middle holding a compass jellyfish found on the British coast. But the other two in jars on either side of them are preserved in a weak uh, preservation fluid called um, formalin or formaldehyde. So it's like 3% concentration. Most of the collections that I look after are preserved in 80% ethanol or sometimes in 100% for molecular research. But for jellyfish, the best preservation um, fluid over time, we've recognized um, that it is formaldehyde and it doesn't break down the tissues of such a um, gelatinous animals, fragile animals such as sea anemones. But what happens in uh, preservation in this way, fluid preservation, you lose the colour. Although interestingly, you can see there's orange there. And um, that's probably something to do with on the, on the left hand side of um, a siphonophore jelly. You can see the orange there. And that's probably something to do the way that the colour, the structure of the colour pigment of an orange um, embeds itself into the architecture or into the, the, the body, bodily cells of um, the jellyfish. But for most things, you lose the colour. Um, and so this is where, um, in terms of preserving these things on, in the museum, then came um, in the 1860s to the 1880s, is Leopold and Rudolf Blaschke. Um, they were from uh, Czech, so it's interesting, Adam, you're in, in Prague. <laughs> um, um, and they did move, so Leopold is the father on the left-hand side, Rudolf is on the right. Um, they came from a family of um, a very um, or jewelers that would make costume jewelry and so forth. So very, um, very well known for their craft and and the, and the family, you know, um, the tradition of craftsmanship was was passed on. Um, but uh, Leopold eventually moved when his son uh, Rudolf was sixteen, moved to Dresden, and they had a house in Dresden where they worked in isolation on their own. What is really interesting about these two gentlemen that they didn't employ anybody, but in terms of natural history collections and kind of bringing them alive in another way um, through these glass objects, they sold these objects to many natural history museums and a few art colleges around the world. So again, this is a different expertise. So this is where I say I'm on the intersection of art and science. So I'm very passionate about, about glass and about these objects. And I have um, documented them throughout, throughout the world and visited many, many collections. I have visited Prague on the hunt for the collections that they have in their um, in you know, natural history museum there but uh, so I look after these are um, the ones from my the collection at the natural history museum we have over 180 of these these are absolutely amazing the Blaschkas use scientific work and they also wrote letters and apologies if I don't say his surname correctly but um, um, those that uh, are in the art world will know of Ernest Haeckel or Haeckel and um, the art forms in nature but Ernest Haeckel did also um, study jellyfish so in my office at the museum I have an original book uh, or tome on the deep sea jellyfish of the Challenger expedition that Ernest um, um, you know studied scientifically and did a lot of illustrations in there and we also have some of the physical collections of jellyfish um, preserved in jars um, that were collected on this Challenger expedition. So the Challenger expedition um, was from 1872 to 1876. And it's when scientists, international scientists went on board this ship to actually, um, uh, act actually with scientific uh, questions in mind, like how deep is the ocean? What animals exist there? And they actually dredged up and collected a lot of these animals. But where the uh, Blaschkas come in, is that, as I said, you don't, in terms of the preservation, especially of soft-bodied animals, you don't 
um, retain a lot of their shape and form and color. So the Blaschka models, they use the um, documentation of people like Ernest Heckel from his scientific work and the plates in there, and um, an English naturalist called Philip Henry Goss. He, um, in 1860, um, published a book um, about the sea and enemies around the British coast. So the Blaschkas actually copied um, a lot of those illustrations. And I find that really fascinating that from flat, you know, just um, basic illustrations, they created this 3D art form in glass. It's absolutely, I mean, the photos do them some kind of justice, but to actually see these collections up close and personal, and how they can, so the models I have are a date from 1862 to the late 1880s. So they made sea anemones first and then they made some really complex uh, models. So you can see there's um, here an octopus from 1883 and then um, some jellyfish here. The jellyfish are stunning when you look at them from above to see the structures um, uh, exactly how true jellyfish are. It's amazing. So the jellyfish were made around the 1870s. And here you can see the Blaschke's own um, uh, um, illustrations themselves that they duplicated. And you've got um, a squid on, on the right-hand side. And then on the left-hand side, these models are amazing. So what they did, so these models were made uh, around 1886. And um, their interpretation, this is an interpretation, a glass interpretation of a microscopical animal called um, um, a, a form for, foraminifera or a radiolarium. And these animals in real life are microscopical and they have magnified it in glass 500 to 1000 times. And they actually document it on some of their archive um, illustrations that are held in the US and I've been to see them. Absolutely stunning. The mathematics, the craftsmanship to go into that model on the le left still is mind blowing to me. And I've spoken to many glass artists about how they would have created this work at that point in time with hardly any, you know, fancy technology is amazing. But so, but these um, models, although they're labeled within the museum documentation as specimens, so yeah, to hunt for them but uh, these models were often displayed alongside the real animals pickled in jars within the Natural History Museum in London and many other museums so that members of the public could get a little bit more of an insight to what they would look like in reality and um, the colours of them. Um, we are actually using CT scanning. Um, so not only for um, real animals and, and the specimens that we have to um, get in-depth knowledge without having to do dissections on the material that we have, especially because it's very old and historic for a lot of the material. Um, we are using the scanning to look inside real specimens, but to um, reveal how um, the Blaschke glass models were made. So this is a CT scan of the octopus. And then this kind of links into how you would um, display and interpret natural history in these animals too, because this CT scan could be seen as an art form in itself as well, and, and the way it's displayed. Um, so that's some of the technology that we're using to give us, um, to make us more informed about um, the natural history world and environment around us. So in um, 2015, I was, th this was kind of like a new era for the Natural History Museum in terms of exhibitions and um, the context of displaying um, natural history. Um, Previous to this, uh, some of the exhibition displays were, um, well, we were having less actual um, specimens on display and more technology in interpreting um, the natural world. Um, and in 2015, it was decided and, and through some evaluation research with members of the public, our visitors, that they actually did want to see more real specimens on display. So within this exhibition that I was involved with, we had over 250 actual specimens come from our collections 
out into the public domain domain into this exhibition. Um, so you can see on the left there, there's a beautiful coral showing its um, coral light. So all these little circular things with very ornate designs and patterning. And that's how you tell um, the species of coral um, when all the, the flesh kind of dies away. So this is a coral skeleton essentially that you're looking at. And then we've got um, some uh, barnacles that um, uh, obviously live in that same environment encrusting the coral. So we displayed the dead corals, but we didn't want it to be all doom and gloom about the plight of coral reefs. Um, we wanted to also inform and empower people that say that you can do something about coral reefs around the world. And we also at the back of the museum's um, coral reef exhibition, we had um, a living coral reef. So basically we had fragments of uh, baby corals so, and we had um, time-lapse film footage. So there were cameras just monitoring this um, aquarium as the corals grew, which was pretty amazing so that people could see that. But also it made that connection for the, the dead corals within our collections and the messages there about coral reefs, how they were collected, but how um, due to climate change, um, coral reefs are ble um, bleaching right through to at the back of the exhibition that seeing what living corals actually look like and appreciating that and what could be done. And there was also film footage with um, some communities in Bermuda that are also um, um, looking after their, their coral reefs and how they work with um, scientists internationally, but also um, those indigenous communities being empowered of how to look after the reefs themselves. And um, we also, um, in terms of forming this e exhibition, we did get insight from, as I said, people in Bermuda and elsewhere, but also scientists internationally. And within our own um, uh, museum worker com community as well. So it wasn't only our gallery interpretation, exhibition specialists, there were scientists, there were um, staff that work in the galleries that interact with the public from public engagement, all forming, one big team to develop the ideas to um, see whose voices were going to be amplified um, within this and then the life of an exhibition afterwards online and how you still continue to engage with the public. Now purely because of time Adam tell me how much time I've got left. Um, so but I think I'm nearly coming to the end of my presentation anyway. Right, um, shall I carry on? So I think we we'll have, still have like 10 minutes to go. Okay, brilliant, thank you. Um, so in 2017, um, the museum um, decided to um, change the um, natural history interpretation in the main spaces of the Hintzy Hall, so the main hall of the museum, and um, take it back to um, some of the original ideas when the museum first opened. So you've got the main hall and then um, kind of stemming off from it, you've got individual bays on one side, um, there are bays that were originally, so originally when the museum opened in 1881, the main hall was called the Index Museum. Um, and um, at Waterhouse, who was the architect, the idea um, was, uh, and with the um, director at the, at the time of the museum, was that one half of that hall would be dedicated to fossilized material um, such as dinosaurs and earth sciences and minerals and then the other side to life sciences so living things and so in 2017 it's essentially um, the museum went back to those original ideas but also we removed um, um, Dippy, the Diplodocus dinosaur from there, that went touring during the pandemic around the UK. Um, but um, the narrative now that we wanted people, we wanted to produce advocates for the planet, the, the, the world, there's a planetary emergency about the um, environment globally. And so we hung, hung hope the whale. And um, so you can see that in the right hand um, image there hanging from the ceiling. So Hope is a blue whale that was beached um, off the coast of Ireland um, some time ago. Gosh, I can't remember the, the year. Apologies for that. 
but um, and you also can see there that there's a globe in the center uh, or um, uh, inflated earth and that is a more contemporary artist Luke Duram so he has around the UK um, uh, done these in installations of the earth and the moon and I think we're about to get the earth coming back to this main hall but again the interpretation there to the public was to say look we need to care about our planet we we need to engage in these discussions we need to understand the world is in crisis we need to care about things like you know the whale and also very microscopical things in the ocean that also help feed the ecosystem and the and the food chain um, higher up because a lot of the animals I do my research into are, are very tiny but important to um, ocean health. And then um, finally here, um, just most recently, well, last March, um, during the pandemic, I was working with a group of our gallery interpretation specialists um, and we opened um, what we call is our broken planet and how we got here and ways to fix it. It was opened in um, um, in segments, so not all in one go. But what is brilliant about this exhibition for the first time, we have multiple voices with throughout um, this exhibition. And we are tackling not only climate change, but things in terms of social justice. So for this picture here, we have uh, um, uh, from our botanical collections, um, you can see there's um, a painting of uh, sugarcane, and then the smaller book on the left um, uh, shows, when you look at it very closely, shows how the sugarcane um, um, was processed and refined um, through enslaved labor. I think again, it's through Brazil, I think that that illustration is, but also giving, so giving the visitor um, the, uh, you know, some of the context of, of how um, we, we got to, you know, having sugar in our tea and, and things and the kind of labor that was used, um, the equipment that was used, but then also, you know, how um, we integrate um, you know, in terms of the plant specimens in scientific work. And there you can see that that panel says the real price of sugar. So to give um, members of the public an insight, you know, that there, there, there's a cost of colonially of human life to, to sugar and how that industry has become what it, what it is now. But we've had many researchers' voices. So a quote from each researcher or curator throughout um, the exhibition there. And people at the back of the exhibition can also leave their own ideas and thoughts of how we are to save the planet. And we do um, pose a few solutions as well of what people can do, you know, every bit, bit counts. And um, I myself am in the exhibition in terms of jellyfish. So I talk about jellyfish blooming um, because of um, the predators on certain types of jellyfish, um, are, are, their populations are declining because of overfishing. And interestingly, sort of talking about overfishing, you then get jellyfish blooms because they don't have their, their natural predators, but the jellyfish clog up the, the fishing gear and um and also uh, and also the oceans but there i'm i think my quote is about well it are are jellyfish the next um major food source i mean i've never had jellyfish myself but um you know in certain parts of china they do um utilize um animals from the ocean um quite a lot um, and they do eat, there is jellyfish soup. So it's, um, you know, getting us to sort of think about it and that whatever um, uh, products food, um, that we buy and um, that they should be sustainable from sustain sustainable sources um, in terms of fish and, um, and other things um, that we should just be mindful of how we use them and to reuse them and to recycle. Um, and so forth. So I think that's the um, end of my um, uh, talk, Adam, and, and thank you all for listening. There's a nice picture of me doing a walk in the countryside. <laughs>